Loving God was a crime I'd be an outlaw I would join the fight They could not shut me down Well, good morning, Solid Rock Church, everybody out there in uh, YouTube land. It's a great day. It may be raining outside, but the Son of God always shines Amen. right here in our hearts, right? Amen. So everybody stand, if you would. We're going to worship the Lord now. The Bible says, now is the day of salvation, and if you're saved, it's time to worship the Lord all the time, and now it's time to worship the Lord. So no matter what your circumstances are, what you're going through, it doesn't matter because... Whatever you're going through, you can raise your hands to Almighty God and worship Him because He cares. He's in control. Yes. He definitely is in control and He loves you no matter where you're at. So let's, let's just take a moment and quiet our hearts, get away from the distractions outside and whatever's going on in our lives, and just take a moment to be quiet before the Lord and get ready to worship Him, church. Heavenly Father, we pray your will be done in this place today and in our hearts and to those who are out there in YouTube land listening, Lord. We know Pastor Todd has been a little bit under the weather today, but you've raised him up. And we pray, oh God, that your Holy Spirit will speak through him and, and enable him to clearly and concisely with love share your message, Lord. Give him stamina. Heal him in Jesus' name that he might bring your word to us today and help us to worship you in spirit and truth. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.
If you know God is good, say amen. 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 He is. song asks a very important question and then makes a very important statement. Who is God to you? And you can proclaim who he is to you as we sing this song.
and forever and forever I will sing who you are to me yes Lord praise yes, him Lord. give you give him a hand yes. amen praise, him. praise Jesus please be, be seated. seated kids are dismissed to kids church Now we think it's upstairs. Yes. They seem to be going that way. <laughs> Life has a way of changing. And I can't deny that it's time to let go of the safe and familiar and leave all I've known far behind. So Okay, good morning again, and welcome to church. Good morning. Who's happy to be here? Okay. We're happy to welcome you here. We're so thankful to have a place to come into worship. We're thankful to be able to reach people through the internet. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm standing here, you know what I'm going to ask, right? Everyone knows. Who read their chapter this week, if you did, raise your hand. And if you didn't know what chapter, if you just read your Bible at all, raise your hand. I got more hands. See? There we go. I'll go into my spiel. You're cheating yourself. You're cheating yourself if you don't read your Bible. You're setting yourself up for failure. How would your week have been, Matt, if you wouldn't have read your Bible this week? See? There you go. I got a first-hand account right here. He said it would have been much worse... And so if you didn't read your Bible, you could have had a better week. Next week's another week. We're starting it right now. We're going to read the Bible today. And then hopefully you can read it every day as you go through your week. Uh, this week was, your assignment was Ephesians chapter 4. Um, last week, uh, Johnny brought a sermon that was awesome. Uh, it was about conflict resolution. And you can check that on YouTube if you missed it. You can go right there on our channel and get it. Uh, two weeks ago, we were in Ephesians chapter 3, and that sermon was titled, The Church. And today, the title is, The Hard Stuff. So we had the church, now we have the hard stuff. <laughs> uh, in chapter 3, Paul explained the doctrinal reality of the church, and it was pretty awesome. The doctrinal reality of what the church is, is awesome. Especially when you get it the way Paul wants you to get it, the way it is revealed. Um, here in chapter 4, he takes us to the practical. So we step down from like a theological thing to what practically does this mean? Um, and it, it's basically how the church, which we have now defined, the church is the people. Who knows that's true? Say amen. The church is the people, not a building you're setting in, no matter where you're at today. The church is the people. So how the church or the people should conduct themselves. And that's kind of the hard stuff, okay? Um, 
Ephesians chapter 4 is going to be a two-week process. So next week, you get to read Ephesians chapter 4 again. And some people were out there going, oh, I was hoping you were going to 5. We'll get there. We'll get there. If you read it. Do 4 again. This week is the hard stuff, because this is talking what he deals with first in the first seven verses. And you're going to find out it's hard stuff, and it may not seem like it. But we're going to go over how, if it doesn't seem like it, you're probably not getting it. You see what I'm saying? And next week is the bad stuff. So we got the hard stuff and we got the bad. The bad stuff is the stuff you shouldn't be doing. The hard stuff is the stuff you should be doing. Believe it or not, that's, it's harder to do the stuff you should be doing than to not do the stuff you shouldn't be doing. Crazy enough. But it becomes real easy to not do the stuff you shouldn't be doing if you're doing the stuff you should be doing, which is why Paul puts it first. <laughs> so, did I get you on that one? Did I, did I, am I sounding like Paul in a circular fashion here? I'm, I'm not trying to, and I'm not trying to confuse anybody, but this week is the hard stuff. So let us pray and get right into Ephesians chapter 4. Bow your heads if you would, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for a time and place to gather and to worship you and to hear from you and to study your word and to be your people. Reveal your word to us today, Lord. Teach us this day from your word. Anoint my lips to preach your message. Where I am weak, you are strong. Give us all ears to hear with and a heart to receive that with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going we're to start off in uh, verse 1. I'm living life on the edge. I left the cap off my water bottle today because I figured I'd be drinking quite a bit. I woke up at four in the morning with a little bit of an upset stomach, but seems to be working out right now. So, <laughs> don't get too close to me. No. <laughs> chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavor endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Amen? I want to read all that just because I... I really think Paul gets going, you know, and to stop. But we're going to go back and dissect. So back to verse 1. Therefore, I, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So for the second time now, Paul refers to himself as a prisoner. The prisoner of the Lord. Not just a prisoner of the Roman Empire, which he was at this time. Um... Which, you know, referring to themselves, referring to yourself as a prisoner would be enough to make most people stop listening. If someone came up to you and said, you know, I'm a criminal. I've committed a crime and they, they've got me locked up, but I'm just out on work release. But I want to tell you something important. You'd probably be like, I don't need to hear that from you. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we, we discount people just because of something like that. And so the fact that these people in Ephesus would listen to the Apostle Paul, in knowing that he's locked up, kind of, uh, I think it kind of bolsters his point that he gets to in these verses, the fact that they continue listening. But uh, I just want to impress upon you, his imprisonment was in a way voluntary, okay? So Paul could have renounced Jesus Christ. He could have done the things they wanted him to do to get him out of where he was at. So he was in there because he wouldn't do those things. It was, it was in a way voluntary, if you will. And so what he says here, he says, I beseech you. He doesn't say, I command you, I order you. This is a voluntary thing he's asking you to do. That you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. So this voluntary, he asks for a voluntary conduct concerning your calling. And your calling is to be Christ's witness. That is your calling if you're a Christian, if you've been saved, if you, if you want the blessing of eternal 
glory in heaven, life ever after. If you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and the work he's done on the cross and you call yourself a Christian, you have a calling. It doesn't come with, you know, you didn't sign up for nothing. You see what I'm saying? Now you have a calling and Christ has asked something of you to be his witness. And Paul says, walk worthy of that calling. So that we, we start right off there with, and it's a voluntary thing. No one's going to hold a gun to your head and make you do these things. Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. That verse is where it's all at. So, remember I said this is the hard stuff. Let's talk about these words here. Lowliness. This word lowliness is a genuine humility that places yourself at the bottom. You put yourself at the bottom. Right? Right? And that way, it enables you to put other people's needs above your own. If you're not the most important person in the world, now all of a sudden you can look to see what other people need. You see what I'm saying? If it's all about me, if you're the most important person in the world, right, to you, how, how could other people's needs matter? Well, I guess if you have everything you ever want or desire, then maybe i got a little time to look and see what someone else needs. Sounds pretty selfish, doesn't it? So lowliness, Paul starts right in here with, put yourself down. You're not as important as you think you are, he says. Put yourself down for a second. Lowliness, that genuine humility. And then he says, meekness. This word is not to be confused with weakness. I used to think, oh, meek, a little weak, you know. Grandma, she sits over there and she's so meek. Because she's 90 and couldn't hurt anyone if she tried, right? <laughs> That's not what meekness is. It's not about being weak. It's really about being strong, quite honestly. Meekness, and I'll give you the definition here, it's not weakness. It is an attribute that submits to God and does not seek retribution against people. You see what I mean? When someone wrongs you, if you're meek, you don't like, well, I'm going to get them back. Boy, are they going to get it from me. They should have never talked about me that way. I'll smear them through the mud. That's not being meek. Meekness doesn't seek retribution. Because if the first part of meekness is you submit to God, and if you submit to God, you already know God says, He'll get the retribution. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So if you want to submit to God, and you want God to fight your battles, you're not seeking for your own retribution. You don't have to get even with people. If you're meek, you don't have to get even. God will fight your battles. Let Him do it. Don't keep taking it away from Him. You see what I mean? Every time you take it away and you get in someone's face, God's like, okay, I was going to fight your battles, but you think you're better than I am, go ahead. You submit to God and you don't seek retribution. Meekness. So we got lowliness, meekness. And then he says this long suffering. Ooh. Here's the one we all want to practice a whole bunch. Being long suffering, right? Not if you really know what it means. Long suffering is maintaining an even disposition and patience under prolonged provocation. <laughs> Did you get that? Somebody just keeps provoking you and you just stay even and calm. Try that one on for size. Uh -huh. Where's Andy when I need to... Andy, try that one on for size. <laughs> me too, me too. I'm pointing at you with three fingers pointing back. Try that one on long-suffering. Who wants to be long-suffering? Yeah. Who wants people to be long-suffering to you? Boy, we all need it sometimes because we're more annoying than we think we are. You know what I'm saying? We, we all somewhere probably have people saying, that person really annoys me. And, and when they do that, we're hoping, boy, I hope they're long-suffering. <laughs> uh, so and then he says, uh, here in verse 2, he says, forbearing one another in love. So that word forbearing is another one. And that one's a good one. That is making allowance, allowance for the faults and failures of others. Making an allowance for the faults and failures of others. People are not always going to do things the way you think they should. 
even when they're doing something for you. They're going to have faults. Man, why did they do that? What's wrong with them? You know, here I'm, I'm revealing some of my thoughts. I shouldn't be, maybe. You know, what, what's wrong with this guy? Why does he keep doing that? You know, but if, you're, if you have forbearance, you make allowance for that. Well, that's just who they are. I, I got it. But this one's tough because it's not just acting nice. If you confuse forbearance for what I call saccharin, you ever know what saccharin is? It's artificial sweetener they put in Diet Coke. Okay? It's fake. So if, if you just, if you confuse forbearance for acting nice, oh, eh, and then you turn around and let them have it to your friends or whatever, that's not it. If all you do is fake forbearance, you will build resentment in yourself and it will destroy you. Or it definitely will destroy the relationship of the person you're faking forbearance to. You've got to find a way with God's help and the Holy Spirit to actually have forbearance. What's he say? In love. You find a way to love that person just in spite of their faults and failures. It's tough. What I, what's the title of the sermon? The hard stuff. And we're only in verse 2. So verse 3, which it, it doesn't get any harder than the, that verse, I don't think. Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So, unity of the Spirit is the endeavor. Remember, this letter is written to a church. It's written to Christian people. It's written to Christian people in a gathering, just like we're in today. In a gathering where we're trying to have these attributes for one another. Right? So he says, the endeavor, what I just told you to do, long lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, I did that because this is the endeavor that we have, is to have unity in the Spirit. Right? And he's going to build on that. We're all in this thing together. When you're a Christian, we're all, we're all in this thing together. You're going to be in eternity forever. If you think, if you think ten minutes in a room alone was a long time with that person who you really had to struggle to have forbearance with. What do you think eternity might be like? We're in this thing together for the long haul. Who's heard that saying? For the long haul. Okay, so uh, we're in it together. And I'll just say this real quick. There's enough flesh in each one individual, and I'll point fingers at all my fingers at everyone. I'm not singling anyone out. There's enough flesh in any one of us to destroy this, this local church. Unchecked flesh and desires of the flesh in any one of us could just destroy this complete body. So that we need some unity in the Spirit. Paul knew it. That's what he's talking about here. Verse 4. He says, talking about this unity, there's one body... There, and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. So the church, this one body, the people, is filled with the same spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in each one of us. Christ promised a comforter. He promised a Holy Spirit that would be in you when you became a Christian. And it's the same one in you as it is in me. It's the same Holy Spirit, same person. And so... We need unity, one body, one spirit, even as, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. So no, no matter what your individual calling is, the hope of that calling is to see people saved. You see, your individual hope is salvation, and you have it when you're a Christian. But the hope of your calling, where you could be called to the ministry, is to see people saved. So we all... All of us, no matter what our ministry is, whether it's music or preaching or, or uh, Kevin had the toilet ministry a few weeks ago where we're all in church and he's down there with a roto-rooter rooting the toilet out so when church was over, people could go to the bathroom. And that was a ministry, folks. It was. So it doesn't matter. His hope of that ministry was to see people saved. Why? Well, people have to go to the bathroom. And all of a sudden, if a church doesn't have a bathroom, people will stop coming. And then they won't invite their friends, and the unsaved people won't come. So the people in the nursery now have the same calling. They're taking care of the kids so the adults can respond to the teaching. 
You see, it's one hope. So he's building the unity in us, and we're all in this together. Amen. Are we all in this together? Say amen. Amen. You got it. Uh, five. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And I've said this before just a few weeks ago. There's one Lord Jesus Christ in all of eternity. There's only one. There's only one Savior to mankind. That's it. One Lord Jesus Christ, one faith in Him. We all have one faith in Him if we're a Christian. He's the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by Him. One baptism. We're all baptized with one baptism that represents all of that. It represents the one Lord, the one faith in Him, dying with Him. It's one baptism that we all have. And we were talking about baptism. We're going to have one soon. Jeff, you going to come up and get baptized here pretty quick? Yes, we're going to be filling this tank, and I think we may have some other people want to get baptized, right? We're going to have another baptism here, maybe next week. We're going to talk to some people after this. But it's, it's one baptism. And what a joyous thing it is when people say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to publicly declare it. I'm going to get dunked in the water in front of everyone to prove it. Right? Amen. So one baptism, verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. And you might sit there and say, well, I thought I had the Holy Spirit in me. You do. And because of that, you have the Father in you. You see what I'm saying? It's Father, God, Holy, Holy Ghost. The three are one. You see? Holy Spirit living in you gives you instant access to the Father because the three are one. It's the, it's the miracle working power of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, and right there, there's, you know, a lot of people want to talk about this or that. But there it is, Father living in you, verse 6, right? What a verse. He, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So, here, this doesn't come across maybe as good as it should in the English. Um, but unto everyone. So he's talked about all this unity. One God, one baptism, one, 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 one. We're all in this together. It's all, all the same, all the same, all the same. And then he says, but we're not all the same. So verse 7 is a but. But unto every one of us because we are all individuals. Even though we have unity in the body of Christ, we're all individual members. That's really what makes the body work the way it's supposed to work. We're not all supposed to be cookie cutters and do everything in our lives the same. You're just not all the same. You're just individuals. You all have different fingerprints. Did you know that? There was a weird factoid I just read. Maybe people are strange like me and like this. Everyone has a unique scent. And if we were as good as like a bloodhound, it's like a fingerprint. I come up and smell Eugene. Oh, that's Eugene. You know what I mean? I smell John. Oh, that's John. Everyone has a unique scent except identical twins. They smell the same. Is that, is that, <laughs> that's a factoid, but uh, you are unique unless you have an identical twin, then I guess you smell the same. Okay? <laughs> and hopefully we all smell good, but that wasn't the point of the thing. The thing, the thing is, we're strong because of our diversity that works together in unity. So it's time to stop denying maybe individuals if they're unique a little bit and see how we can use that. Because we're strong when we make the diversity work in unity. That's why it's such a great thing to have a body of Christ. That's why we shouldn't forsake the fellowship. That's why it's so important to come together on Sunday as a local church and be amongst the people. See the people. See how they're different than you. See what they need prayed for. They can pray for you. Uh, you can help them. They can help you. That's the living, working body of Christ. Each one of us has a part to play, a role to fill. And here it is, a set of good works that God has beforehand, before you were even a Christian, He beforehand predestined you to walk in. A set of good works. It's, it's out there. You got them. It's there if you want to walk in them. 
But you're going to need these attributes here that we, we talked about. And it's all by what he says here at the end of verse 7. Um, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. It's all only available because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only available because you are a Christian and you're walking in that. It, individuals working in unity only happens really in the church. Because outside of the grace of Jesus Christ, we find a way to fight amongst one another. Sometimes, even with the grace of Jesus Christ, we find a way to fight amongst one another. As Brother Johnny pointed out last week, I really encourage you to see that sermon. So, that's all I'm going to read today. But, I'm going to ask you a question, I want to show of hands again. Who wants to go to church with people, or have friends with people who are lowly, meek, long-suffering, and forbearing of one another? I do. I want that, right? I, I need that because I'm a jerk sometimes. You know, I'm, I'm pretty grumpy this morning, quite honestly. <laughs> Didn't get all the sleep I should have got. So if I say something to you today, give me a little forbearance. Okay? <laughs> I'm sorry. Be a little long-suffering with me. Sometimes in the past when I've been grumpy, I've maybe done a sermon that was a little better than the last time because I didn't care. Um, so I want that, and, and you've raised, I think everyone raised their hands that you want that, and that means that we should be seeking to attain these qualities ourselves. If that's what you want, then you need to have that to give back. That's, that's how it's going to work in unity. Remember, it's the hard stuff. This is very hard stuff to do. You will need constant renewal of your mind. Apostle Paul says this in another place. You will need constant renewal of your mind with the Word of God. And that is why I try to keep you accountable each week when I say, who read their Bibles? And people raise their hand. And you know what? It's starting to work. I get more and more hands. I get more and more people asking me or Rachel through the week, what was the chapter? Sometimes through a text message, and that's very encouraging. If you ever can't remember the chapter, you just text Rachel or myself and it won't bother us a bit. We'll be happy. Boy, there's another one going to read their Bible this week. Amen? That's, you need that. You have to have that. You have to have the constant renewal of your mind. Uh, you, you will need to be diligent. Now listen to this. You will need to be diligent with your prayer life. You understand what that means? Diligent means doing it on a regular basis. You need to be diligent with your prayer life and you need to pray for success in this endeavor. This endeavor. And, and well, what do you pray? Help me, Lord. Help me. You'll need the power of the Holy Spirit living in you to empower you to do this hard stuff and He'll help you when you ask. Right? So we had people come up last week for prayer for conflict resolution and people going through some hard stuff with some individuals they weren't really getting along with very well and I'm not going to mention names but I've heard back from, a, from them and they've had some victory this week because they prayed they were diligent and not just praying up here that was the first step they go home and pray you say Lord help me because I'm getting ready to go meet up with this person that, boy, we just about got in a fight last time. Help me, Lord. Help me stay calm. Help me. Help me do the right thing. Help me. Boy, he wants to answer prayers like that. You got no problem on that one. Lord, help me win the lottery? Probably not. <laughs> Lord, help me be long-suffering. Help me be meek. Help me be forbearing. You got it. You got, you're going to get some help. It's still hard stuff. It's still hard stuff. It's, it's not easy. I almost feel like I'm doing a recap on Johnny's sermon last week, but that's the way God works. Amen? And so I'm just going to point out something to you here. The world is offended by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's an offense. It is offensive. You see what I'm saying? If you're, if you're not saved, the gospel of Christ, if you think it all through, is pretty offensive. And the Bible says so, and Jesus says so. And so that means the world is offended by you if you are a Christian. So when you walk out of here and you come into contact with people who are not Christians, don't be surprised when they don't treat you the nicest. They're offended by you. You are offensive. 
and so be it. But here, this, this sermon is about here. Apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus. Here amongst believers, the body of Christ, we get to be around people who are not offended. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's such a beautiful thing not to forsake the fellowship. Here, when we come in here, we get to let our guard down and know that these people love us. They're not offended by us. And even though I might be a jerk sometimes and I do things that annoy people, they're going to be long-suffering. They're going to forbear me with love. I mean, that, that, that's what Apostle Paul's talking about here. You let your guard down. Who's happy they can come in here and let their guard down? Just be themselves. Amen. That, that's, that, that's what this is about. And you know what? The people in this church that you go to church with, if you need help, they'll help you. They'll help you. Just ask. I'm telling you. I know they will. I've done it before. I've asked people in this church to help me. And they've done it. I'll tell you a little story because I've got time. Just real quick, and I'm going to try not to choke up, but I probably will. Which means I probably shouldn't tell it. But, a couple, three weeks ago, I'm riding home from work on my motorcycle, trying to get all, all of the last good weather, and... I start smelling oil, and I look down, and my side case of my motorcycle has come loose, and it's just pouring oil out of the engine. So I pull over, and I'm like, oh boy. You know, what am I going to do? So I was supposed to meet Johnny here at the church to go over some music, so I called Johnny real quick. Hey, man, I'm, I'm stranded on the side of the highway. He's like, okay, I'll drop the kids off. I'll be right there. And then I, I happened to pull over right at on 31 where Kevin's Road meets 31. So I just called Kevin. I'm like, see if Kevin's awake. He's like, yeah. I'm like, hey, man, I'm broke down. You got a, access to a trailer or anything? He's like, yeah, I'll be right there. You know, hang the phone up. 15 minutes, they're both there. Load my motorcycle up on the trailer, get it back to the house. I called Jesse Sutton after they left because he works on motorcycles. I said, told him what was going on. He's like, well, that's crazy. I'll come over and look at it in a little bit. He lives out by me. He comes to church. And before I knew it, all this going on, I forgot I talked to Chris Galtieri the night before to help him fix the brakes on his Jeep. And he pulls in the driveway. I'm like, oh, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> so we get the Jeep in there, and we fix his brakes, and we just get it down, and he's pulling out, and here pulls Jesse Sutton in my driveway. So I've had Johnny, I've had Kevin, I've had Chris. Here comes Jesse, and Jesse's like, hey, man, I'll just load your bike up and take it home and fix it. How's that? I'm like, okay, sure. So we loaded up, and by that time, I've been away. It's noon. I've been awake all night and, you know, whatever, and I didn't have to go back to work. That's good. So I go to bed, and meanwhile, Jesse works on my bike the whole time I'm sleeping. Right? Just one another helping each other. He has it fixed the next day. I took it somewhere to have it worked on. It'd still be in the shop. You know what I'm saying? But what happened? I just asked for a little help. And nobody even blinked an eye. That's what you got. The people you go to church with, they will help you. I know it for a fact. And if you, you ask someone to help you and they won't help you, you come ask me. You got it? Because we're in this thing together. We're supposed to be in this thing together. We're supposed to be a body working together. So I'm happy to say that we have a strong and functioning women's group. Women's group. Um, we've talked about their meeting that they have once a month, and as of yesterday, we have a men's group here in this church. And the point of having these groups, uh, that anyway, that men's group, first Saturday of each month, the point of having these groups is to help one another build these qualities into our lives. What qualities? Lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance of one another when we meet together and get to know each other as individuals, because Paul says we're all individuals. And we can build that unity in. That's what the purpose of those groups are, to build this into one another. So I'm going to end with this as I'm running down here. If you want the power of God in your life, you need to seek these qualities. You need to seek these qualities. Lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance. You ever hear anyone say, you better check yourself. <laughs> it's usually when you're being a jerk. <laughs> okay. And someone's about to bring the hammer down on you. And they're like, dude, you better check yourself. You know what I mean? God says, you better check yourself for these qualities. You need to be building. So if you want the power of God in your life, why don't I have the power of God? Do you have these qualities? Seek 
these qualities. If you want the power of God in this church, this local body, you need to apply these qualities to the people you go to church with. You apply them. You apply the lowliness, meekness, long-suffering. You see what I'm saying? If you want the power of God in this community, the local community, you need to show these qualities to the people you come into contact with. And then you'll see the power of God. Why doesn't anyone listen when I try and preach the gospel? Probably because you're a jerk. <laughs> I mean, probably because you're not lowly, you're not meek, you're not long-suffering, you're not forbearance. People spot a fake. What did I say about saccharin? Right? You can't fake it. You'll just be like saccharin. And maybe some people like Diet Coke, and that's okay. But when I pick up a Diet Coke, boy, I know instantly it's not regular Coke. That's not sugar. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when people are fake, they know it right away. Boy, they're fake. They don't care about me. They're just trying to make a show for their friends. As soon as their friends are around, they talk bad about me. You can't fake it. People recognize a fake. If you want the power of God in this community, you're going to have to show these qualities. And that's the challenge this week. Stand if you would. I'm going to dismiss you and bless you. None, none of this is available to the, to the non-believer. None of this. The first and foremost thing you need in your life is the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin. Without that, forget all the rest. So if you need salvation, if you need saved, you come forward after the service. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't know if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, they, the church down the street, Faith Outreach, had, a, had the uh, heaven's gates and hell's flames, and you wouldn't believe the number of people that went forward. It was an amazing deal. When people are confronted with their sin, and they're told, without the Lord Jesus Christ, you are doomed to damnation. That's when they can and will respond. So that's what I'm telling you right now. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, you are doomed to damnation. And everything I talked, this whole sermon that you may have listened to, means nothing unless you are saved. And if you are saved, it does mean a lot. If you want the power of God in your life. So keep that in mind. Come forward if you need prayer for any reason when I dismiss you. So bow your heads if you would and let me bless you. I want to say may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May he bless you as you go out, bless you as you come in, and in everywhere that you find yourself, may he make you a blessing to the people you're coming into contact with at the same time while he's blessing you. Make it so in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Next week, Ephesians chapter 4.